Welcome everyone to our webinar today, Applications to LSVT Big to Neurological Conditions Beyond Parkinson's Disease. We're delighted that you've joined us today and we hope the next hour is, produces a lot of fruitful information for you. My name is Laura Gousset, I'm a physical therapist and I'm joined by my colleague, Heather Siance, who's also a physical therapist. We both serve as LSVT Big Training and Certification Faculty for LSVT Global. Um, briefly, just a little bit about us. I'll kick off the webinar today for the first half of it, and then I'll pass the baton to Heather, so we'll be co-presenting today. Um, Heather is an extremely experienced physical therapist who works in Philadelphia at the Dan Aaron Parkinson's Rehab Center at Pennsylvania Hospital. Um, she has been treating clients with neurological conditions for many, many years and has been certified in LSVT Big since 2007. Um, she's also an integral part of the team at the Parkinson's Foundation Allied Team Training Program for PD and is a speaker and author um, for many different organizations. So she's um, really uh, very much an expert in the Parkinson's world and delighted to have Heather with us today. I myself am also a physical therapist with uh, many years of experience treating adults with neurodegenerative disorders of many different varieties, and I now serve as the LSVT Big Chief Clinical Officer for LSVT Global. With that, we do have a couple of disclosures that we always share with our audience. Um, both Heather and I have non-financial and financial relationships with LSVT Global, including a preference for LSVT Big as a treatment technique. Heather is a consultant and I am an employee of LSVT Global, which means that we receive lecture honorarium. In terms of our webinar today, I just wanna briefly go through the webinar. In every webinar, we have um, some participants that this is their first one joining us and many of you in the audience, I'm sure have been to multiple webinars that we've had in the past. So this webinar is an hour long. It is being recorded. So if you need to go back and review anything or um, share it with you know, someone who you think might be interested in about a day or two, it'll be posted to our blog in the webinars section. Right now, everyone's microphones are muted. So there's no background noise for our from your environments. And I apologize in advance if there's any background noise from Heather and our environments, <laughs> um, but we do our best. At the end of the presentation today, we hope to have a few minutes left to answer your questions live. At any time during this webinar, you can type in any questions related to this topic mm -hmm. in the chat box or the question box of your webinar control panel, and we'll answer as many as we can. Um, some of those might be naturally answered through the delivery of the content during this webinar as well. Um, if we run out of time, you'll be able to always email us at info at lsvtglobal.com, and we're always happy to answer your questions. At the very end of the webinar, when you log off, you should get a link to answer a short survey. And we'd love it if you'd answer that survey so that we can get some feedback about if this content was valuable to you, how you did, if there were any audio or technical difficulties or, or anything like that. If you are a therapist joining us today, we want to let you know that these are not pre-approved or state registered for CEUs for speech PTs or OTs, but if your state allows you to self-report your CEU credit for a non-pre-approved CEU activity, um, you can certainly do so. Simply email us a request for a certificate, um, and you can see that email address is webinars at lsvtglobal.com and we'll put on the certificate your name, um, the title of the webinar, the date of the webinar, and the duration as well. So um, you do have to attend the full hour to earn a certificate. If you um, are watching this webinar in the future and in the, uh, the on-demand format, you can also request the certificate by uh, emailing webinars at lsvtglobal.com. These are the three very broad objectives we have for today's presentation. And these public webinars are really geared toward many different types of um, people in our audience. We always gear them towards people with Parkinson's and caregivers, but welcome 
therapists who might not yet be certified in LSVT Loud or LSVT Big either. So we'll briefly review the research and clinical reports that use LSVT Big for neurological conditions beyond Parkinson's disease. And we'll discuss how therapists determine if a patient with um, a non-Parkinson's condition might be appropriate for LSVT Big. And we'll also tell you a little bit about what LSVT Big is and how we personalize it to meet the needs of a range of patients. So before we get started with the content of the webinar, we'd like to know who you are because that really helps Heather and I to understand um, where the questions might be coming from and how to best address those. So just give me a second here and I'm going to launch this poll. Shouldn't take you very long to answer it. Um, hopefully those categories um, fit you, one of those categories do. Let's see, this one. Okay, and we'll give you 15, 20 seconds, something like that to go ahead and answer the poll. Give me just a few more seconds. Looks like almost everyone has answered. Okay, great. So I'm going to go ahead and close this and share the results with you. And I think you can see that almost all of you, a good portion of you are physical therapists or occupational therapists, students or assistants related to that profession. Um, we have a few speech language pathologists, some people with Parkinson's, um, a couple that are other conditions and a couple that um, you just don't fit in one of the categories. So thank you for answering that that poll. And it looks like um, it's because we have a range of participants, we'll do our best to speak to all of you during that. Let me just get back to our screen again. Okay. So for those of you who aren't familiar with LSVT Big, we want to spend maybe 10 minutes or so just giving you a very high level overview of what LSVT Big is. And for those of you that are quite familiar, um, hopefully this will just be a really quick review. One of the questions that I always get is what does LSVT stand for? And the acronym stands for Lee Silverman Voice Treatment because it began um, exclusively as a voice and speech treatment for people with Parkinson's, and we now call that treatment LSVT Loud. Later on, uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy treatment protocol was derived from that, and then we call it LSVT Big, so it improves movement, mobility, balance, function, ADLs, and we use it um, with people with Parkinson's and other neurological conditions as well. LSVT Big is delivered only by certified uh, physical or occupational therapists who are certified in the technique. In terms of the research, and we're going to go through the research in much more detail during this webinar, um, so far there have been two randomized controlled trials, uh, one systematic review, and 15 other smaller studies on people with Parkinson's disease. In terms of the research on LSVT big and other populations, we have four new but small studies. So I would say that research is emerging, but we're excited about it and are eager to share that research with you today. LSVT big and LSVT loud are similar in that they share three key concepts that we'll talk a little bit about. The protocol incorporates principles of neuroplasticity. So things, types of exercise, ways of exercising and learning that actually can change your brain function in a positive way. They're administered intensively to challenge your system. So it's not only a compensatory treatment, but we're really um, trying as best as we can to use these principles to improve function, um, both uh, motor function and brain function as well. And the way that we do this is we have a single target of amplitude. Because this treatment was developed for people with Parkinson's, 
um, we note that one of the key symptoms of Parkinson's is movement that's too small or too slow. And so we really drive amplitude to scale up to more normal amplitude. Our mode is intensive and high effort, and our goal is that the clients would generalize this better movement to life and not just improve in the treatment room, but really and truly um, carry it over to everyday life. Let's start with the first one, which is target. So when we talk about using bigger movements, it's really larger amplitude movements across the whole body. So bigger posture, bigger arm movements, bigger you know, leg movements with walking or other activities, and even bigger movements of the fingers, You know, really stretching the fingers out, spreading them apart. What we see happening, particularly in Parkinson's disease, is that movements over time become smaller and slower as the dopamine in the brain is depleted. And so what we do through exercise and through therapy is drive amplitude. We drive the patient to make bigger movements so that the movement results in healthier, more normal amplitude. One of the exciting things about LSVT Big is though even we have even though we have a single focus on amplitude, we see a spread of effects across the system. So we'll see improvements in posture, balance, range of motion, um, speed of movement, etc. Across the sessions, um, it's intensive. We recognize that it's not easy to learn a new way of moving, and so there's a lot of repetition of practice built into the LSVT protocol. Patients are seen four consecutive days for four weeks in one hour individualized treatment sessions. In addition, they have daily homework practice and daily carryover exercises all 30 days of the month. And our goal then is to not only get people moving better, safer, more independently, but get them in this habit of lifelong continuous practice that helps them to then maintain that function over time. During the sessions, it's also intensive. So we're not afraid to push our patients to high levels of effort. Um, we're put driving their amplitude. As they improve, we might increase repetitions, add resistance, add balance challenges, drive accuracy, um, driving to healthy levels of fatigue. Now we're always doing this in a medically safe way for each individual recognizing that each individual has um, their own exercise capacity. But as much as we can safely do, we're driving that effort um, and we're driving that motor system. Our goal then is calibration. One of the interesting things in Parkinson's disease and perhaps in some other neurological disorders is that there's a mismatch between how a person perceives they're, they're moving and how they're actually moving. So typically in Parkinson's disease, a person doesn't recognize how small or how slow their movements have become. As we begin to train them to move bigger in a normal amplitude movement, it feels strange to them. It feels way too big. And so internally, you know, they might feel like they're walking in this exaggerated fashion and say something like, you know, people are going to think I'm crazy moving like this. Um, whereas the therapist is saying, wow, you look fantastic. You should always move like this. So that mismatch is tricky. You know, it takes a lot of feedback from the therapist. It takes a lot of practice from on the patient's part and a lot of feedback from others that they are um, around to get them more comfortable with these, using these bigger movements. Our goal in LSVT Big is generalization of these bigger movements to function in everyday life. Sometimes when a person goes to physical therapy or occupational therapy, they work on exercises that are fabulous, that improve you know, amplitude, range of motion, strength, balance, etc. but they stop short of actually practicing the functional task. They may assume that you know, doing a big movement like you know, swinging the arms is going to translate to this woman's ability to walk her dog better, but it doesn't always do, do it that way um, just automatically. What we do in LSVT Big is not only train patients how to move bigger and better through these exercises, but then we'll actually train functional tasks. So you can see the similarity between the exercise and the function that's important to this client. The exercises um, are shown here in these little thumbnail pictures. There's seven core exercises that are part of the LSVT Big Protocol. 
You can see that she is moving in all directions, forwards, backwards, sideways, rotational activities, working on posture, balance, et cetera. Um, and just please note as well that these exercises can be adapted to someone who maybe can't stand. We are able to adapt them to a seated position or even a supine or lying down position. On the other hand, we can make them harder for people that are really high functioning as well. The LSVT big exercises help in a number of ways. They are very challenging exercises and we can make them very challenging at least. They not only improve amplitude of movement, but they can help a person be able to start and stop their movement on demand when they want to, so they control their body. They help with direction changes, building endurance, improving balance, reducing risk of falls, um, sometimes building strength, improving range of motion and flexibility, and improving posture as well. So the exercises in and of themselves are really helpful, but how can we connect them to function to make it meaningful? Like I said, part of the treatment is actually practicing functional tasks that are meaningful to the patient, and they're different for every single patient. For someone, it might be as simple as wanting to button their own shirt independently and more efficiently. For some, it might be taking care of kids or grandkids, gardening, putting socks on, social activities like going to the movie theater. So we really practice those tasks using their bigger and better movements during that. In this way, we can individualize the treatment protocol to a variety of individuals, and not only those with Parkinson's disease, but those with, with other diagnoses as well. And we do that through um, individualization of the exercises and also um, application of functional tasks that are meaningful to each person. So let's move on and take a look at the research on the application of LSVT big to conditions beyond Parkinson's disease. So the first two studies I'll go through are two published case studies of LSVT big used with individuals that had um, stroke quite a long time ago. This first study was published in 2009 um, and it was a single case experimental design study. It included two clients who had late post-stroke. So one had had stroke three years ago, the other 12 years prior. And the patients um, chose their own tasks that were meaningful to them using a tool called the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. And they also used something called the everyday arm use in the community and home. And those were measured repeatedly um, over the course of the treatment study. So LSVT Big specifically trained three of those clients' chosen tasks, but they continue to measure the impact on the untrained tasks as well. So one client reported resuming many activities he hadn't done since the stroke. So he was able to clean out his garage, his shed, the bathroom, do laundry. I think I want this guy at my house. Um, pruning trees, he lit a campfire, a chopped wood. And this was an individual that hadn't been able to do these things in over three years since his stroke. And as you can tell, they're really high level activities. So exciting that he was able to return to those things that were important to him. I'm sure he had a laundry list of things he was waiting to get done again. The other client that had had the stroke 12 years ago had also improved. And one of the really nice quotes from it, I'll share with you, she said, so now I'm not sure, if I'm not sure in a situation where I can start with a big movement or big posture, I just go from there. The big posture helped me to not further injure my tendonitis, which was underlying, and it encouraged me to use my arm rather than stop and avoid the activity. So um, learned non-use is a real thing that happens in many individuals with stroke, and this um, individual was able to resume using that arm again. The result showed improvement on either the self-assessment or the blinded rater assessment for all but one activity, whether it was trained or untrained. Um, furthermore, uh, the author said that it improved confidence and engagement in valued occup occupations. Um, that same client that was talking about, you know, just trying it, using her arm more, also said that um, she was able to ride her bike again and she didn't expect that that progress would happen in 
four weeks. So these are just two clients. Obviously, we can't generalize it to all people with stroke, but they made some nice improvements. The other study on stroke was also a case study published in 2018, and both of these studies were, um, were the treatment was delivered by occupational therapists, which I also think is really, really interesting and, and really positive. In this one, the client was a 52-year-old woman who had had a stroke 29 months earlier, so about two and a half years earlier, and she had mild to moderate hemiparesis of her dominant arm, which was her left arm. Um, she was still independent with everything. She was a very motivated woman and she ran her own restaurant, but over time she learned how to do everything with her non-dominant right hand and really avoided use of her left hand that was affected by the stroke. So she also showed improvements on the COPM, the Wolf Motor Function Test, and active range of motion on her affected arm. Um, the amount of improvement exceeded what's called the minimal detectable change. Um, on the Wolf Motor Function Test, 45% decrease in the average Wolf Motor Function Test um, test task time. So it's a huge amount of change considering the minimal detectable change is only 16% and she was at 45% improvement. Um, she resumed normal range of motion in her arm. Um, her spasticity actually improved and she noticed subjectively that her movements were smoother, more controlled. She was using her both arms, like carrying trays, pouring lemonade or iced tea using her left hand. Um, and the most important thing is that she made improvements that were meaningful to her. So she was able to use her arm more in the workplace and in simple things like shampooing her hair. So it speaks to the salience of the LSVT big treatment. This last study was literally just published this month and it looked at feasibility of LSVT big in stroke. This was published by the same author, Profit et al, as the last one that we just spoke about, but this was with five clients. It was a um, waitlist crossover design. So they wanted to look at the feasibility, acceptability, and the preliminary clinical effect of LSVT big in people with chronic stroke. So this is what they looked at, the feasibility and acceptability, and then secondarily, they looked at the COPM scores and the Wolf Motor Function test as well. Um, the recruitment rate was 28%, which seems low, but they said it's typical of um, stroke studies. And of the clients that did attend, those five, 100% uh, made it to their in-session, in-clinic LSVT big sessions. Four out of five of them rated their COPM scores higher after the intervention and made clinically relevant improvements. Um, and the therapist said she was able to personalize and progress their treatment in the same way as they would with individuals with Parkinson's disease. So they concluded that it was indeed um, feasible to do in clients with stroke, but further research needs to be done, of course. And this last case study is not on stroke, but on LSVT big used for an individual with idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus, which you know has um, similar symptoms, can have similar symptoms to Parkinson's disease. Um, there are actually no studies looking at PT interventions for people with NPH. And uh, certainly there have been none before looking at LSVT big and NPH. This individual was someone who was diagnosed with NPH 16 years ago, and he had multiple um, surgeries for his shunt and shunt revision, but none of them really resulted in lasting changes. And the individual was still having falls with turning and dual tasking, um, and over time had become very sedentary, where earlier in life he was very active and athletic. So they um, looked at his outcomes after he had received LSVT big and then a series of five tune-up sessions seven months later. They used the Berg balance scale, uh, balance test, the timed up and go, the three versions, um, the ABC scale, which is a self-reported rating scale on balance confidence, uh, the five times sit to stand and timed floor transfers. In this individual, they found an improvement of 20 points on his Berg balance scale score, 
Um, his ABC score improved 45.9%, which um, both of those exceeded the minimal detectable change. After he was um, discharged and they saw him back for a tune-up again seven months later, or excuse me, four months later, they found that he actually declined in his score somewhat, but not back to baseline. And after they did a few tune-up sessions, he um, improved again to nearly the same level with his Berg score. His floor transfer speed also improved. Um, they didn't see any changes in his tug or in his five times sit to stand. Subjectively, the patient said that he no longer needed to use his rollator in the community where his, uh, he was before. He was falling less, um, he's walking faster, and he was less fearful of stairs. So in summary, um, we see, as we see in these cases, LSVT Big has the possibility of being successfully used with, to help people with chronic stroke. And in this um, new study, in one individual with normal hydro pressure um, hydrocephalus. <laughs> so if you have clients and you become LSVT Big certified, these are certainly diagnoses for you to consider. And Heather's going to go much more into other diagnoses that we haven't studied as well. Um, these studies were also interesting because they looked at occupation-based measures and individualized um, goals in these populations. And I think um, the, the application of LSVT big by occupational therapists, in addition to physical therapists, really brings new meaning and um, broadens the perspective of how we can help people with these neurological diagnoses. So exciting to see that as well. As with many studies, there's always limitations. Um, these were case studies or very small sample sizes. So, you know, you can't generalize this to the whole stroke population, certainly. Um, one of the suggestions from the Metcal study was looking at el which elements of the program contributed to the improvements that were made. And in some of them, they lacked a blinded assessor as well. So you can find all of the references, including these new ones, on our blog. In there's a research section. You can either download just the LSVT Big references, and if any of the articles are open access, we've also listed them in the open access section as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Heather, who's going to walk you through this next part. Great. Thank you so much, Laura, for all of that. Um, great overview of some of the research that's coming out. It's so exciting to hear about these studies. So um, the ones that Laura had talked about with stroke and NPH, these aren't the only uh, other diagnoses out there to consider. And clinically, all of us as instructors and in hearing from you as clinicians around uh, not just the country, but the globe, have really seen that people with other diagnoses actually can benefit from LSVT big. And again, we may not have research on it, but that doesn't mean that it's not a technique that you can certainly try with your patients. And we're going to talk about why LSVT big might be helpful for some of those other conditions that uh, you may be seeing in your clinic. And then also we'll touch upon how do we as clinicians decide if a patient is actually a good candidate for this technique. So when we think about those other neurological conditions, we wanna think about what is it that LSVT big is actually doing? What's it helping? Well, by using LSVT big, we're actually using really well-known principles of brain change, meaning neuroplasticity, that change of what's actually going on in the brain. And those principles are intensity. We know that LSVT big, not only through the exercises, but also through the functional component tasks and all the different functional mobility tasks we have patients doing, we push them to very intense levels. We do a lot of repetition, so there's a lot of room uh, for trial and error and then patients ultimately hoping to be able to learn how to input this information in. We consistently make it more complex and we know we need complexity to really drive that brain change. So once something becomes easy, we make it more challenging. And then I think most importantly, we make sure that things are specific and salient. Um, and this isn't just for our people with Parkinson's. Our folks who feel very motivated to do things, so by doing things that are important to them and doing things that are specific to what their needs are, are going to be more motivated to continue what they're doing. 
We also know that we're using these well-researched motor learning techniques during practice. Um, so we're doing all sorts of different things with blocked practice, with sequential practice, with changing it around, um, and just really helping folks to learn what they're doing. And one of the other things we use really nicely with LSVT Big is really that in extrinsic feedback. And that means that we as the clinician are really there to help mold that patient. So we are modeling through what we're doing with our bodies, we're touching our patients, so we're shaping them, and we're really driving those patients to get up to those high levels. And then once they're able to do it, we keep them doing it and we make it more challenging and we stabilize them there. So it really does help those patients to repeatedly learn how they're actually doing and then what needs to be improved. So if we're not showing our patients kind of what is broken at first, they don't know what they need to fix. And using LSVT Big really does help with this. Also, we're really helping to promote those intrinsic feedback. And again, that's by teaching patients the principle of what we call calibration. And that means we're helping those patients to kind of reset their internal motor program, meaning they are feeling and they are becoming much more aware of how their bodies are moving and how that quality of movement is impacting the function that they get out of that. So they're able to kind of reset that, fix it, and then set it on the right course. And then also through promotion of generalizing to other tasks and activities. So it's, it's being able to work on things in the clinic, but also having your patient report back to you, you know what, I'm able to do X, Y, and Z better now. I'm able to say, you know, I made these large amplitude movements and I really um, put my effort up and all of a sudden I was able to do this much better. So I just wanted to share that with you. And that's a wonderful thing when a patient can repeat back to you that they're able to apply and promote the techniques you're training them, not just in the clinic, but also at home. So how do you as a clinician decide if LSVT Big is actually appropriate for your patients? Well, there's lots of things you wanna think about. You first wanna think about, you know, is there an activation deficit within the muscle? Is there that slowness or that smallness of how they actually kind of uh, promote or invoke that movement? Um, is your patient having problems with sensory processing? Are they not sensing or feeling kind of where the body is in space, how they're not moving with the correct amplitude or moving in the correct, um, you know, even direction of what they're doing? You also have to make sure that that patient is medically stable. As Laura said before, you know, this is a challenging program and we really do push our patients to a high level. So we need to make sure that they're medically intact enough to do that. And again, if your patient has cognitive impairments, this doesn't mean that LSVT big is out. Absolutely not. What we do need to ensure for anyone who's having any kind of cognitive impairments, is there another support system in place though? Um, we can't expect patients to remember everything and to be able to cue themselves if they're having those deficits. So if we have someone who can help them out with that, great reason to go for it. And then lastly, we wanna take a look at what we call stimulability testing and seeing if our patient is actually able to respond to what we're asking them to do. So when you're doing that evaluation or you're doing that first treatment with your patient and you're working on driving their movements to be um, much more intense, you're driving them to make bigger movements, you're driving them to really think about what they're doing. If your patient is able to respond to that and start to produce those movements for you, that's a really excellent sign of being able to stimulate them to improve that function. So really the ultimate decision is based upon that therapist assessment. So it does need to be a therapist, whether it's a PT or OT, um, who is first and foremost certified in LSVT Big. So through that assessment, during your evaluation, looking at your outcome measurement tools, looking at the um, functional tasks that you put them through and kind of putting that in your mind, okay, what am I finding from this? And then trying to stimulate them saying, okay, well, this looks like it's too small. This looks like it's too slow. Um, this looks like it's an initiation problem. Let me see if I can help this patient to kind of really get the effort that they need to kind of make that explosive movement and make that movement bigger. And then thinking and putting on that clinical decision-making cap saying, you know what, this might be an option for this patient. And again, you can always as a clinician start a program and then think, you know what, this isn't best for my patient and go back and try something new. So we always say, you know, let's give those patients a chance. Um, much like the research is showing, even people who are post-stroke for a number of years can still make improvements. So a little bit more about that stimulability testing. 
again, when you are driving the movement, so when you are physically modeling the movement and you're driving the patient's movement with your voice and your actions, can that big, does that big amplitude actually improve the quality of the movement? And then you want to take a look at your patient when they're not cued, right? They're just doing their own movements and you're assessing what their transfers look like. You're looking at bed mobility. You might be looking at handwriting. It's anything that's functionally salient to that patient. How they move versus after you've cued them to move. You know, were you able to make that nice distinction between, hey, when you put more effort and more intensity into it and more amplitude, things get better. But then you have to think about your patients who maybe who are at a lower level or those who actually have cognitive deficits, even patients with dementia. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. It doesn't mean we are thinking for every single patient to be 100% independent. It may be that the patient simply needs someone to cue them to be big. So maybe before it was that the spouse was actually having to do moderate assistance and was doing constant verbal cueing. And now maybe you were able to get them 50% cueing and contact guard, but they need to have that ability of someone there with them. So um, don't discount people who need a little bit more help with that for cognitive reasons. We can still work on them. We always tell people, go ahead, trial a week of the LSVT big treatment. If it's successful, awesome. Keep going. You're doing a great job. And like I said before, if you're not seeing those improvements and that patient's still struggling, change your plan of care and go through with something else. So some of the other diagnoses to consider and some of the things with a number of the faculty that we have used LSVT big with and for what we're hearing from clinicians in the community are people with brain injuries, uh, patients with atypical Parkinsonisms, and I in particular work with a pretty big population of folks with this. We've heard wonderful things about people with MS. Just your general folks who are having age-related changes, who are having balance and falls. Um, we've had a number of spouses who have actually been really kind of motivated by seeing the improvements that their loved one with Parkinson's actually was able to make. And we get them in for therapy and we assess them and we find out that they're having issues that actually could be helped from that too. For some people with different levels of spinal cord injury. And we do know for, at least with LSVT Loud, we have some research out there about um, pediatric conditions, so pediatric neurological conditions such as CP as well as Down syndrome. So let's run through some of the clinical examples. Some of these are going to be my actual patients. I can give you more detail. Another are going to be from some of the faculty members. Um, so this was um, work with one of the occupational therapists who went through the LSVT big and had been working with patients with dementia and two particular patients stood out. Um, and these patients were having a lot of falls. So the falls were just increasing in frequency. And this therapist was really seeing a rapid decline in function. There was a lot of that movement paucity, meaning that there was that slowness or that hesitation of movement. Um, and in the work that she did with these patients, she was, uh, the PT also there, um, was saying, you know, saw that patient for two times a week for six weeks. And that can be a normal course of care for a lot of us with patients. Um, and they were seeing that, you know, they were maintaining function, but really weren't progressing. They weren't getting kind of all that bang for their buck. Now, what they did was a full, full care partner training because these patients with dementia needed the extra support, um, needed that cueing from the family members, and they were using videos as well. So the LSVT big homework helper was really nice. And what they found was able to actually get these people to be doing stair training and they were actually able to multitask so being able to carry objects while they were walking and i think one of the best things here when you look at the outcomes is they really did have a nice reduction in the number of falls and when they came back in four months later for a reassessment or a tune-up they had been able to maintain their gains and that's through the help of continuing to have those care partners with cueing those patients. So again, they tried a normal course of care two times a week for six weeks, wasn't working, switched these folks to LSVT big and made some nice changes. Here's someone with a stroke and uh, that stroke in the basal ganglia area. And we know what are we gonna see if that area has deficits. This was a gentleman, middle-aged in his 60s um, when for seen for therapy, he was still using an assisted device and was not able to drive at all. There wasn't even a, a thought on anyone's radar that this would um, be able to happen. 
a very, very low tolerance for exercise. Um, when he was tested for his heart rate, respiratory rate, his response was of someone who had been severely deconditioned, so someone who really hadn't been doing much for a long time. And this, folk, this gentleman really wanted to get back to driving, wanted to be able to be mobile in the community, get back out there and do the things that he loved. And the therapist said, you know what, I'm gonna go for it, let's try it. Did the four times a week for four weeks. At completion of the therapy, uh, he was able to ambulate safely with no assisted device. Um, both the physician, the family, the patient, and the therapist all felt comfortable with being able to refer that patient uh, for a driving assessment. I'm sorry, but I can't tell you what the outcome as it was of that, but it was really exciting to hear that he was even being thought of as a possibility for it and was able to go from that person who was, you know, really deconditioned and was able to transition to a fairly vigorous exercise class or group class. So a lot of nice changes for this gentleman, both in his cardiovascular response, um, as well as in the quality of life. And this was someone who had atypical Parkinson disease and the atypicals are uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, multiple system atrophy, um, cortical basal degeneration. Those are probably the top three that you might see in your practice. And um, a lot of times these folks are misdiagnosed as this patient was. Uh, so several, several times of getting the wrong diagnosis, first it was Parkinson's, then it was PSP, and then ultimately determined to be multi-system atrophy. And what had happened when uh, the, he was first seen in therapy really was found to have some loss of vocal function, was falling up to 12 times a day. I mean, that's an exorbitant amount of falls, was walking with a four-wheeled rolling walker um, and was working on regularly including personal yoga sessions, pool, gym. So he was really trying to work out. He was trying to get exercise in um, and unfortunately had tried PT several times and really wasn't having um, much success. And when the therapist talked to him about that, had found that he was only seeing the PT about one to two times per week. So this therapist decided to try the LSVT big. And again, you know, sometimes it's a shot in the dark. You don't know if it's going to make that change. Um, but it's very important to have that dedication and buy-in from the patient and family that, hey, this is something new and this might be something that feels a little out of your comfort zone but let's give it a try and see what we can find out. Um, fortunately, this gentleman had really um, some dramatic improvement over those four times a week for four weeks and had decreased the falling to really no more than one to two times per day. And when you're going from 12 falls a day to this, it's just miraculous. Physical performance at home was fantastic. Um, and the therapist shared that um, he was just so happy with what he was able to do um, that he was crying during that last session and just spoke so highly of how much better he felt about himself. Um, that therapist was able to see him for a few more tune-ups over time um, and really was able to maintain that status for the next 18 months. And what she said was uh, the patient eventually moved away, so we don't know how he did after that, but you know, for a year and a half, that's really excellent with a condition like MSA. This is a really fascinating uh, case, and this was another one of our uh, PT faculty had worked with a gentleman who was a 20 year old, um, and he had had a very, very serious car accident. You can see a lot of fractures, had some spinal cord involvement, blood clots, internal injuries, um, really sick, was in the hospital for a long time, was on a ventilator, went through rehab, and you know was sent home with a walker. And for somebody who was a very, very active, um, gentleman of a young age to be sent home with a walker, that's pretty traumatic to the, not only to the psyche, but also to the body. Um, she had not seen him until even a year later. So um, through that year, you can imagine um, the deconditioning that must have gone on as well. Um, he was at that point walking without a walker, but still wasn't able to go back to work. And he was a gentleman who worked outside and did a lot of climbing of ladders and really kind of heavy duty outdoor work. So she said to him, you know, again, not sure if this is going to work. Let's give it a try. Let's push forth, found some really good stimulability with him, decided with him what are those functional component tasks going to be. Of course, sit to stand. Um, he wanted to be able to get back onto the ladder. So one of the functional component tasks was actually climbing the steps, um, but trying to perform it as if on a ladder, being able to step on and off of a stool and being able to balance on one leg on a step stool and then being able to place objects overhead while on that step stool. So again, 
pretty high level things. And then that hierarchy task for him to be able to complete um, employment, he had to be able to climb a very tall ladder with a very heavy toolbox. And she confided in us, um, you know, how nervous she was about that, but how well he actually did. So these are the outcomes from what she found. You can see she did the mini best test, uh, the five times sit to stand, the tug times three, and the ABC. And I think what's beautiful, not only in those outcome scores, but also in the amount of his confidence, because remember, even if patients test at a better outcome score, if they still lack the confidence in themselves, they will pull back and they will not do as much as we need them to do. So he completely met his goals at that four week mark and was actually able to return to his work doing all this outside work for the township. So really, really quite impressive for this gentleman. So those are some wonderful examples of people that you might have thought, oh, I don't know if this is right for them, but we actually saw some great changes for them. But there are patient types who really probably may not be appropriate for this. We know with ALS, we, we don't have that promotion of the high intensity exercises. When you're working with somebody who does have MS, if they're actually in an acute exacerbation, um, again, that's not the time to be doing such high intensity, as well as folks who are, again, in those acute phases of myasthenia gravis and someone who is um, very, very kind of fresh post CVA. So I want to step back because you, you've heard both Laura and I talk about amplitude, right? We're talking about size. When we're talking with people about Parkinson's, we're trying to get those movements bigger and therefore we make those movements faster and improve the functionality. Um, but sometimes with patients who are not Parkinson's disease or even with some of our, our rare patients with PD, the target of amplitude is sometimes really more about learning how to control the movement than actually overriding the small movement. So getting them to understand where the placement of the body should be and how to actually control what they're doing. You know, it may not be better for people who have ataxia to be making these large movements, right? And then trying to force them to go faster. Oftentimes we do see with our patients with Parkinson's who have had the deep brain stimulation that they're hyperkinetic. So they actually have too quick of a movement. So using LSVT big again can be to kind of help them, you know, control that movement. And again, if somebody is very impulsive, it may not be that we're using the word big, right? And we're trying to get them to move as, as fast as they can with those big movements, but we're getting them to actually learn how to control the movement. So again, you can still provide LSVT big simply by shifting that focus onto that word control as opposed to that word big. Because really in the back of your mind as a clinician, it's really all about function. The bottom line is, is what can we do? You know, can we improve that patient's functional mobility um, and improve their safety through that? And you know, does that patient maybe need to rely on cues? And again, cues are not always a bad thing. Cues can actually help to reduce caregiver burden. Again, like I said before, if you have a caregiver who's constantly having to give cues and you're able to get those cues reduced by even 25%, that's gonna reduce burden. And again, cues can really improve that patient's safety and independence, right? So that maybe they don't need moderate assist. Maybe now they just need standby assist. And again, with that, it allows couples to be couples again and not to be so much patient and caregiver. So you can see some improvements really in that quality of life. And then that patient's belief in what they're able to do. So improvements in self-efficacy. But then we also think about, you know, now we've done this and we, we've improved this motion, improved the quality of life, but, you know, how do we help this person? How are we going to get them to be able to do those exercises at home? So again, we want them to continue with the program, but we might need to, you know, customize that to make it more practical for them. Um, so we may need to shift some of the exercises into a seated pose or into a pose where someone's holding on. Um, if you have a team, um, list the whole team. If you're able to work together, PT and OT, absolutely. Social services can be helpful as well if they're in um, speech language pathology. And again, there's no reason why some people can not do it and just always need the homework helper video to be able to do it. Maybe they're not able to remember them, but maybe they're able to watch that video and perform beautifully with that. So if you are someone with Parkinson's disease or you're tuning in because you have a loved one with Parkinson's, 
um, if you're thinking about that or thinking about someone not even with Parkinson's. Um, the way to get started with this therapy is for um, getting a referral from the doctor. So it's a, it's a prescription for PT or OT so that they can do an evaluation and treatment. And if you're not sure, if you have someone in your area who does this, you can always go to our website at lsvtglobal.com and you can click on the link right here. We have an example here for how to find an LSV clinician and you'll click on the link for LSVT big. And I'm going to go ahead and pass this back over to Laura now. She's going to talk to you about some of the exciting new options that we have available. All right. Thanks, Heather. Um, so if you're a physical or an occupational therapy professional or student, that includes PTAs, OTAs, and students in all of these professions, and you're interested in becoming LSVT Big certified, um, there's two ways that you can get certified. We have had an online LSVT Big training and certification course now for about six years. It's very convenient. It's a self-paced course. Um, you've got 60 days. It takes uh, around 16, 17 hours to do it. And that's one way that you can get certified. The other way is that you can take a virtual live course. Now, typically we have in-person courses, but of course with COVID-19, we're a bit limited there. So we're super excited to have launched these virtual live courses where um, it's, it's kind of a blend between online learning. You'll do some of the learning in pre-recorded modules and then the methods where you really practice exercises, interact with each other, um, see a lot of demonstrations are done virtually live using either Zoom or GoToWebinar so that you can see the instructors, they can see you, etc. cetera. Um, so if you're interested in those, they're both listed on our website. The virtual live ones are listed under the live course category and I've listed the dates here below. Um, you can find those on our website by clicking on the Get Certified button or you can go directly to our store and find those as well. Um, so brief summary, we see that research is beginning to show evidence of potential benefits of LSVT big for people with diagnoses other than Parkinson's disease. And we have um, a large amount of anecdotal evidence as well of progress being made in other neurological diagnoses. As of today, we have trained over 24,000 LSVT big certified clinicians in about 43 countries. And so that body of clinicians has really also um, contributed to our clinical knowledge of LSVT big. Um, if you're a patient interested in trying LSVT big to improve your function, you really have nothing to lose. Get evaluated by an LSVT big certified therapist, and if they think that it might be a possibility for you, do a trial week of treatment. And for therapists and for patients, when you're considering treatment options, it's really always the clinical decision and that discussion um, between the therapist and the patient and physician as to what's best for the plan of care. Our next upcoming webinar is going to be next um, month, August 19th, Wednesday, the same time, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. And this one is specifically going to be targeted for care partners of people that are receiving LSVT loud or LSVT big or have received it in the past. So if you know of um, people like that that might be interested, it's going to be a great topic and one we haven't really presented before. You can find the registration link in our blog under events and then free public webinars. So we have a few minutes. We'd love to ask, uh, answer your questions. You can do that a few ways. If you have a question, you can type it into the question box on your control panel. If you'd prefer to ask your question out loud, you can click on the little hand icon on the left side of your control panel. We'll see that your hand is raised. Um, we'll call it your name so that you know that it's your turn. Please make sure that your microphone is not muted if you're gonna ask your question out loud. And as always, if you think of a question later or you have something private to ask, you can email us at info at lsvtglobal.com. And while you're doing that, I'm going to answer a question that came in to us via email prior to this webinar. And I hope that um, the author of this question is attending today so that you can hear the answer. But the question was, I'm interested in knowing if you have any data regarding the success of using LSVT big for primary lateral sclerosis and or hereditary spastic paraplegia. 
Um, I'll be attending the webinar this afternoon. So those are two both devastating diagnoses, um, really, really difficult for the person that's been affected by them. And as you can see in the webinar today, we do not have data or research on those specific diagnoses, nor can I really tell you if um, we really have anecdotal evidence. I haven't heard any and Heather hasn't either. Um, PLS, I would be a little bit more cautious about in um, attempting it and really educate yourself on what is the underlying pathology and how that might be responsive and if it's safe to do an intensive exercise program like LSVT Big. Um, you can always, like Heather said, do stimulability testing and a trial week of treatment, especially for the HSP, um, if you think that that person might be responsive to an amplitude-based approach. So I know that's a bit vague, but that's as best of an answer that we can give you at this time. Um, okay, I think there's another question that just came in. Um, does LSVT Big help with improvement with fine motor coordination? Heather, would you like to answer that one? I love that question. Thank you for asking it. People get confused all the time because we're talking about big, 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 um, but absolutely. Um, especially we know in our patients with Parkinson's disease, when that fine motor coordination um, goes, it can be really troublesome for handwriting, for buttons, for typing, for um, being able to pull up pants and zippers and things. Absolutely. LSVT Big works on all parts of the body. We do um, things called flicks where we work on really kind of dramatically um, opening the hands and really forcing that extension of the fingers and the wrist. And we find that kind of Prepping people with that before they actually do a small task is important. We know that even the small, small movements and the fine motor movements are too small with people with Parkinson's. So absolutely, those things can be worked on for that. All right, thanks, Heather. And right now, I don't see any other questions that have come in. I think maybe one more just came in. Um, all right, does LSVT help with decreasing off time, um, maybe in a PD patient or that a PD patient has. Um, I'll go first, and Heather, if you have any to add, you can certainly jump in as well. So in terms of reducing the actual amount of off time, no, I don't, I don't think so at all. There was um, a study published out of Japan by Ueno, um, and I might be saying the author's name wrong, that was looking at does LSVT big potentially help improve motor function and mobility or during off time and there was um, some trends towards seeing improved function during during off time but that's the only study that I know. Um, Heather do you have anything to add to that? Yeah Laura you said it exactly I mean there really isn't anything that shows that it, it, it lessens the amount of off time um, but we do know that people who are more active and are doing things like LSVT big can actually show that they can move a little better during their off time. Um, but limiting the amount of off time is something that you'll really want to work with your neurologist on. That's more from a medication standpoint. Good. Okay. Um, I think there's one more question here. What CPT code do you usually use for billing? And I'm not sure if you're a PT or OT, but we'll assume that you're a PT since we had so many PTs joining us today. Um, Heather, which ones do you typically use? I use the ones that I'm um, doing. So if I'm working on a transfers, I'm doing therapeutic activity. If I'm doing gait, it's gait training. There's no magical one for LSVT. You're billing for what you're actually doing. Um, PT and OT can both bill for self-care ADLs. Uh, when I make things much more challenging and I'm working on balance, I'm clearly doing uh, neuromuscular education. So it's basically the normal ones that we have for whatever we're doing. It's just um, what are we actually providing at the time. Okay, thank you. Let me just make sure that we got all of our questions answered. I believe we did and good. We're just about at the top of the hour right now as well. So uh, again, we just thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you liked the webinar and learned a few new things. If you have questions at any time, please email us. Um, there's a lot of information on our website and blog as well. If you wanna learn more about LSVT Big, 
please do complete the survey. That should be either emailed to you or it might pop up pop up automatically after you close the webinar today. So um, have a great day, stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and hopefully we'll see you next time.